IGF code. Thank you, Yogi. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Um, today we are discussing, uh, I think, an issue that's really at the center of uh, internet governance worldwide, and um, and that is, you know, the conflict that's evolving between the world's two biggest economies, uh, the world's two biggest sort of internet powers, uh, and of course it is affecting uh, the rest of the world as well. Uh, I'm Milton Mueller. I'm a professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology. I'm in Atlanta in the United States. And I uh, run an operation known as the Internet Governance Project, which has been a longstanding participant in the IGF and in ICANN and, and other internet uh, governance institutions. Um, I believe uh, that the US-China relationship is extremely important and it has been uh, particularly uh, painful and difficult to watch the deterioration of the relationship between the two over the past, uh, really more than the last four years, the past 10 years is really, I think things have gone uh, downhill. Um, now we are, on the cusp of a somewhat new situation, of course, we have a, a new president-elect in the United States. We don't know exactly how that uh, new person will change or maintain existing policy. We still have an unresolved trade war. Uh, we still have a, a blockade on chip technology uh, between the United States and China. And, uh, very recently, we have a very interesting conflict between uh, a major Chinese internet innovator, Jack Ma of Ant Group, and the Chinese Communist Party, uh, which indicates that um, you know, not all is uh, similar and uniform uh, in China itself. Um, it seems like uh, maybe the platforms in China are uh, in some ways as disruptive of government as they have been in the United States and are becoming as controversial as they are in the United States. And of course, the US has just had uh, major hearings attacking the platforms uh, for antitrust purposes and uh, some mentions of Section 230, which are mostly domestic US issues, but again, they show kind of a general global trend. So what we want to do today is foster a, a dialogue, uh, you know, a reasonable and uh, mutual understanding uh, from the US and China. And we want to understand how the rest of the world uh, is affected by this conflict. And we really do want to come up with some uh, practical and uh, feasible proposals for moving forward and making the internet uh, uh, whole. If, if you will. So those are my introductory comments. Now let me turn it over to my co-organizer of this panel, Dr. Peishi Shu. Thank you, Milton. Uh, uh, thank you for putting us uh, together. And this is a really a very challenging topic. Uh, I basically have uh, two points in mind uh, to approach this topic about overcoming uh, China-US digital code war. Uh, the first uh, uh, point is that uh, in spite of the huge differences between the internet uh, governance models between China and the United States, I think it's also equally important to pay attention to the similarities. And uh, I think it seems to be a very reasonable assumption or presumption to, uh, to say that the two countries are very different. However, I think uh, uh, it, it might be to some extent mistaken if we really accept this kind of presumption. And uh, uh, the fact is that uh, the two countries actually uh, face many of the same general challenges and many of the same specific problems. For example, in terms of how the digital economy should be governed, uh, the national or the central or the federal level of government have uh, some uh, some have a conflicting views with the local authorities at the state level or at the provincial level. And also there is a kind of a dispute. This is also the same challenge that is shared by both countries. Uh, that is uh, uh, building a single digital market or having a very 
fragmented, fragmented way of decision making in terms of uh, sharing economy, uh, like uh, a ride sharing and uh, uh, home sharing, and also e-commerce taxation. I think the two countries have a lot of similarities. So the first point is that uh, we should start from the similarities. And by looking at these similarities, I think is, uh, uh, is, it can help us to understand the drivers and the people behind a notion of a digital cold war. And uh, why did it happen in such a way globally that uh, there's a notion of a digital cold war? Uh, I think why it is true that internet governance has now covered a lot of dimensions, including a military dimension. It is more true or it is truer uh, that uh, the digital code war notion was to some degree invented or imagined or exaggerated or conjured up uh, by politicians or think tankers or security minded personalities. And it is not uh, very constructive in looking at uh, internet governance in such a way. And point number two is that we should distinguish higher values uh, from lower values. Uh, I would say that uh, the the Commons narratives uh, are higher values in terms of internet governance. Uh, however, the sovereignty uh, narratives are lower values. So uh, it's happy to observe that uh, uh, beyond the sovereignty narratives, including digital sovereignty or cyber sovereignty or technology sovereignty, there are uh, voices about uh, global commons or internet commons or cyber commons or uh, digital commons, so uh, all global public good. Uh, in that case, I would mention the example of a EU Cybersecurity Act. It has defined uh, the core internet resources as a global public good, uh, and that is a very good practice. And uh, if we can put more things of internet governance under such a basket of commons narrative, and uh, it can be more uh, constructive. With that, uh, I give the floor back to you, Milton. Thank you. Um, yes, I think that um, the, the similarities between the US and China are actually pretty interesting. Both of us actually are kind of revolutionary countries with gigantic uh, domestic markets. And there are similarities, although there are huge differences in values. So with that, let's get into our first question. And that is, do we see the rise of China's digital economy as a threat to the values and standards of the open global internet? Uh, or could we say the same thing about the clean networks initiative of the US? Are we promoting uh, the open global internet or is the rise of China a threat to it? Let's begin with Steven Anderson of the US State Department. And um, he is, uh, well, I'll let him introduce himself in terms of his exact title. Um, and uh, yes, let's go for about five minutes, Stephen. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Milton. Uh, it really is a, a pleasure for me to be here with the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, I'm the uh, Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Communications and Information Policy uh, at the State Department, and that I'm a, a career official uh, who's been with the State Department uh, since 1994. Um, I'll go ahead and, and, and launch into to my comments. Uh, um, again, it really is a pleasure to be here at the IGF. The IGF is known as a, has gained prominence as an open, inclusive, and transparent forum for dialogue on internet related policy issues. And it really is great to be uh, a part of that dialogue. So, for the last three decades, the internet has been an engine of global economic growth and innovation. And in fact, the internet's value stems from the fact that it provides an interoperable platform for all of us to connect with each other, to do business, share opinions, and exchange information exactly like we're doing here today. Uh, the United States government promotes a vision for the internet that is consistent with its core values, as were mentioned before. Uh, and we share those with so many of our partners and allies, respect for human rights, belief in democratic principles, and faith in the power of a market-led economy. That is, we support an open, interoperable, reliable, and secure internet. Like-minded countries around the world 
have in fact embraced, embraced this vision. The best way in our view to govern such a diverse and dynamic network is through the multi-stakeholder model. Many diverse voices get their say and no one stakeholder should of course have the ability to reshape the internet entirely according to its designs. Uh, recently, however, the multi-stakeholder model has come under increasing pressure and threat from those including the People's Republic of China, promoting a state-centric and authoritarian approach to internet governance. Detrimental this is, of course, to prosperity and freedom, including those of the Chinese people. Now, to be clear, picking up on a point that was already mentioned, uh, we do not consider this to be a conflict between the United States and China. As Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has said, the choice isn't between the United States and anyone else, it's between freedom and tyranny. The Chinese Communist Party or the CCP espouses a concept of cyber sovereignty that a state has absolute authority over internet activity and technical architecture within its borders. Cyber sovereignty is in our view antithetical to the reality and spirit of a multi-stakeholder internet governance. It's no secret that the CCP seeks to control the flow of information into and inside of China. It is well known how the so-called Great Firewall inhibits the free flow of data across borders, stifles open discussion internally, and limits the ability of the Chinese people to access outside information. However, let's not forget the repressive force it represents within its own borders, where the CCP censors the flow of information among its own people and curtails their ability to freely communicate with each other. The People's Republic of China's national security law requires private companies to hand over any data requested by the Chinese government. And they have to do this without regard for due process, little transparency, no accountability, or respect for individual privacy. Further, through massive state-backed investments like the Belt and Road Initiative and opaque trade and investment agreements, in our view, the PRC unfairly supports its national champions expansion overseas, allowing them as a result to lay the very infrastructure atop which our sensitive data runs. Further, the new information protocol or new IP proposal that they've put before the International Telecommunications Union is in our view an attack on the very foundations of the internet. Quite simply, the new IP proposal attempts to inject the PRC's domestic version of digital authoritarianism into the, pro, into the very protocols that govern the global internet. If implemented, the Chinese new IP would turn the multi-stakeholder internet into a top-down model, granting significant control to state actors. This, represents a, this would represent, in fact, a deliberate shift away from the existing multi-stakeholder model and would disenfranchise non-state actors from the standardization process even though the majority of internet infrastructure remains with the private sector. So if I haven't been clear, although I think I have, you know, the internet we have come to rely on is meant to be open, interoperable, reliable, and secure. It is governed by a multi-stakeholder community to ensure that it remains exactly that way. The positive values that the IGF supports and believes in are engineered right into the logic of the internet's protocols. A state-centric authoritarian model of internet governance represents in our view, an existential threat to the current model. I'm sure we're gonna have an exciting discussion now and I look forward to that, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, uh, excellent. You are right on time. And uh, now I will turn it over to uh, Wolf Fong who uh, I know from uh, his participation in ICANN as part of the GAC, and uh, let's hear what you had to say. Thank you, Professor. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Guo Feng from uh, the uh, China Academy of ICT. I'm also a member of the China IGF community. Uh, I'd like to thank Professor Milton Muller and uh, Professor Xu Peixi for the invitation to join in this workshop. Uh, taking this opportunity, I would like to say something about the latest development of China in terms of digital economy and internet governance. Uh, from my view, 
from my observation that uh, most of uh, government officials, industry leaders, and the scholars in China view that the global digitalization has made a profound influence on the economic globalization and the establishment of a smart society. The scale of uh, 47 major countries digital economy hit 31.8 trillion last year, accounting for almost 41.5% uh, of the global GDP. And the digital economy not only improves the industrial efficiency and the social well-being, but also enhances the releases of economic society. Thanks to the great invention of the internet, uh, the society has not been fully stopped in the face of uh, the global uh, coronavirus 19 uh, pandemic, and the economy has still been running. The internet has played a key role in supporting the operation of the society. The digital economy has become a stabilizer against the downward pressure of the global economy and an important engine for the current global economy recovery. And uh, I would like to take, the, take this opportunity to uh, uh, give you some figures about the uh, overview of the digital economy development in China. Uh, the digital economy is developing and contributes more to the whole Chinese economy. In 2019, uh, which is last year, uh, China's digital economy scale reached uh, up to 35.8 trillion RMB, accounting for uh, almost uh, 37 of the GDP. And China's digital economy increased by 15 in last year. The growth is about uh, 8 percent points higher than the GDP growth in the same period. And uh, in addition, uh, I would like to bring you attention to the uh, global initiative on China, on, on data security put forward by the Chinese government. As you, uh, you may know, you may see that the Chinese government launched a global initiative on data security in early September, 2020. Uh, this initiative mainly includes uh, several points. The first one is approach data security with an objective and rational attitude and to maintain an open and secure and stable uh, global supply chain. Number two is oppose using information and communication technology activities to impair other states' critical infra infrastructure or steal important data. Third, take actions to prevent and put an end to activities that infringe upon personal information, oppose abusing ICT to conduct mass surveillance against the other states or engage in unauthorized collection of personal information of other states. Number four, ask companies to respect the laws of host countries, uh, desist from coercing domestic companies into storing data generated and obtained overseas in one's own territory. Number five, respect the sovereignty, jurisdiction, and the governance of data of other states. Avoid asking companies or individuals to provide data located in other states without the latter's permission. Sixth, meet, all, meet law enforcement needs for overseas data through judicial assistance or other appropriate channels. Number seven, ICT products and service providers should not install uh, backdoors in their products and services to illegally obtain user data. Number eight, ICT companies should not, see, should not seek illegitimate interests by taking advantage of users' dependence on their products. Uh, according to uh, Chinese government, uh, this initiative will serve as a basis 
for international consultation on data security and may mark the start of a global process in this area. Chinese government looks, looks forward to the participation of national governments, uh, international organizations, and all other stakeholders, and uh, call on states to support the commitments and the layout in the initiative through the bilateral or regional agreements. Uh, so uh, thanks for your attention. This is uh, uh, basically what I would like to uh, uh, you, what I would like to you uh, to know at this uh, stage. Uh, so I stop here to see to to move to the next speaker. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Fang. And um, that is, um, I, I think, interesting. I hope we can come back to some of the issues around your initiative on data security uh, when we get time. Uh, right now, I want to turn to a different perspective. You might say somebody uh, in between uh, China and the US in the sense of um, Western values and uh, Chinese uh, values. So uh, Charles, tell us uh, what this conflict looks like from the perspective of Hong Kong. We know that uh, uh, some of your traditional freedoms have been compromised recently and we'd like to hear about uh, your perspective on this. Thank you. Thank you, Milton. I like you saying that we are somewhat squeezed in the middle, but uh, well, uh, uh, I, my, my current capacity for however long it will last is a legislator in Hong Kong. Uh, and, uh, but my previous lives, I had been an internet service provider more than 20 years ago. So I was in the industry and I also started the uh, uh, ISOC in Hong Kong more than 10 years ago. So I've been in different capacity, industry, government and uh, civil society. So I hope I can give you somewhat of a rounded uh, view of what's been happening. Uh, using Hong Kong maybe as a case uh, to look at what is going to happen uh, for an internet conflict uh, between the US and China. Uh, well, for Hong Kong, we have had a uh, free internet, no censorship, no filtering of websites or IP addresses, uh, no internet-based services being banned, you know, for any reasons like Facebook or Gmail, whatever, it's all here. Uh, however, uh, as some of you might have heard, uh, we had recently a, the implementation of a national security law in Hong Kong. Now, I'm not going to be here to discuss or to argue for or against the law. The law is the law in, in Hong Kong. But uh, basically, the law would grant uh, vast power for the authorities to seize uh, servers and records uh, of any online service providers or virtually any corporate or individual entities without any scrutiny or gatekeeping by the judiciary and uh, with global jurisdiction. So uh, to be fair to the Hong Kong authorities, I have to say that to this stage and to my knowledge, uh, the authorities have not uh, used these powers uh, against any of the global platforms or even uh, local companies. Now, that might be because of the fact that they would be able to gather evidence through other means without going to the servers uh, of these companies. But anyway, that's the fact. So uh, part of that, uh, you know, might also be because of the sensitivity toward, uh, you know, if they go after the uh, some of these servers of a big uh, American companies, will it cause another yet another political standoff between you know, the two countries, uh, maybe that is something that they are sensitive about too. So it hasn't happened yet, to be fair to the uh, government in Hong Kong. Uh, for internet users here, however, there's already an overriding climate of a uh, chilling effect and uh, self-censorship. You know, there's been a lot of people deleting their Facebook posts uh, or even the whole profile uh, in the last several months. So uh, while we haven't seen the implementation of a uh, China-style firewall in Hong Kong yet, a uh, great firewall in Hong Kong yet, we haven't seen that, uh, maybe it's because of the economic cost of doing that for Hong Kong as a global financial and business center is just too large. Maybe uh, there are other means to insert the kind of uh, control that the authorities would like without having to go that far. So uh, there, has, there are talks that, for example, will the government here implement somewhat like Singapore style of fake news laws that uh, will allow them authorities to take down certain messages uh, that they don't like. So 
But on the other hand, I think it's also inevitable that Hong Kong's digital economy is moving closer to the China's digital economy. There are talks about, you know, extending uh, Shenzhen and China experiments for the central bank digital currency to Hong Kong. Uh, there are mega listing like, uh, unfortunately, the one that's been cancelled uh, for end financial. You know, in that sense, I mean, this might be one of the areas of the common uh, interest and similarities that uh, uh, Professor Su talked about in the in the beginning that I really like. Uh, if we can find some of those, uh, maybe you know, making money is one of them. So there, so maybe you know, uh, you know, Hong Kong's eco digital economy in some ways moving closer to the Chinese. Uh, a digital economy may not be a bad thing by itself, but uh, the problem is uh, if you uh, look at it from the angle of if we in Hong Kong have to make a choice and we have to go either one way or the other, that might be a problem because in the past we used to enjoy the best of both worlds. Now, are we going to say that uh, uh, likewise for the global internet, we have to choose one or the other? So I think uh, the question is, uh, are we going to end up with two internet, two infrastructures, two standards, or more than two standards or infrastructures and so on? My answer or my guess is that maybe yes and no. First, uh, some of these conflicts as far as the internet uh, uh, is concerned between the West and China isn't anything new. I mean, for anybody who's been to IGF or ICANN meetings and so on, they've always been there. But on the other hand, uh, there might be an enhanced firewall that will happen or all over the world, uh, because China is also going to be influencing many countries in the, in the rest of the world as well, in addition to the traditional American and Western influenced uh, part of the internet world. Now, uh, there might, there, the, uh, you, uh, this kind of an enhanced firewall that I'm talking about uh, may be extended to uh, ideas such as using hardware platforms and software platforms to uh, identify or carry out surveillance and so on uh, that will be enabling these uh, platforms to, to capture data and provide backdoors and so on. Of course, to be fair, there are also a lot of Western companies, uh, Western governments to try to tell their companies to put in firewalls as well, which I personally would oppose. But uh, I think these are the kind of trends that you see. And also, I'm very glad that Mr. Gao mentioned about the uh, 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 digital cyber sovereignty laws and so on that has been recently put on the table or legislated in China. Uh, and uh, I think the key that we should look into these laws in addition to the uh, uh, features and protection that Mr. Gao mentioned is also about global jurisdiction. And I think that is a new concept for uh, many people in, outside of China. And, uh, but then again, I have to say that, you know, China can only say that they learned it from US law, they learned it from the European uh, laws such as EU's uh, GDPR and so on. So global jurisdiction is going to be uh, another uh, issue that uh, internet players in the world will have to uh, face. And finally, I do want to uh, address the point about the US clean network initiatives. Is it going to become a threat to the global internet values and standards? Now, Personally, I don't think it will make a lot of immediate uh, difference right away because in principle, in reality, it's simply the uh, US government or US using China's past uh, great firewall tactics back on China. In principle, if we agree, if we disagree with the uh, uh, great firewall of China, then we should probably also disagree with the clean networks as well. But then if you look at it as simply a form of trade negotiation, a retaliation, trade retaliation, as China has been banning many of these services from the US like Facebook, Google, and so on, uh, you could consider this as simply a re reciprocal trade measure. So in closing, uh, instead of one world, many internet and all separate on their own, we may end up with still pretty much one internet, but a lot of balkanization, and then the, each trying to influence and control uh, the other. So that might be the new normal of the internet that we have to face. Thank you. All right. Um, so I, I want to follow up a little bit and get a little more engagement between Stephen and Fung um, before we move on to the next topic. So um, let me just recall that uh, Stephen was uh, really attacking um, this notion of cyber sovereignty 
Um, and uh, of course, if you know me, I have a lot to say about uh, cyber sovereignty. I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, in fact, I think it's impossible, but um, isn't the U.S. moving in that direction, Stephen, with the, the Trump administration's uh, bans on apps, uh, its chip, uh, chip ex, um, export controls, uh, and so on? And uh, is the new IP, by the way, I think you have misconstrued the new IP. I don't think it's really a new IP, and I don't see values engineered into logic of internet protocols. I think that's a, that's a fallacy, but if there is in fact a new IP at some point coming from China, um, wouldn't, it, you know, wouldn't it be better to just have a technical competition over the merits of the standard rather than uh, damning it because it's, because it's from China? And, and before Stephen answers to, to Mr. Guo, I want to also get some direct engagement. Um, so the, the global initiative on data security does indeed uh, emphasize the principles of cyber sovereignty again and again. I have read them and there are some good things in them, but they're also very much focused on drawing national boundaries around data. And how does that work in the global internet? And don't you see why the US would be a little bit worried about um, uh, Chinese assertions of sovereignty in, in cyberspace? Okay, let's start with Stephen and then go to Guo, Guo Fang. All right, Milton, uh, thanks. You uh, gave me a, a virtual smorgasbord of, uh, of issues to, to comment on there. Um, I'm gonna start uh, just by highlighting one of your own points, which is that uh, you know, my comments were really focused on the threat proposed, uh, posed by the digital sovereignty and the digital authoritarianism uh, that exists within China and that China has been trying to export uh, through a variety of uh, ways that I explained during my, my opening remarks. And then of course, um, the, my panelist from, uh, uh, from China, um, you know, in his remarks specifically outlined a proposal that is exactly that which I criticized focusing on sort of uh, giving states all of the power. Um, despite the rhetoric about not wanting to, you know, about protecting intellectual property rights and, and so on and so forth, given, uh, given the history that we have with large uh, Chinese companies operating in the United States who have, you know, either stolen IP or the forced technology transfers that we've seen for, for American companies operating within China, uh, I find it uh, um, euphemistically, I'll say ironic that those exist in the proposal. Uh, regarding the clean network, uh, it's a very different concept from the GDSI or any of the cyber sovereignty proposals that, uh, that the Chinese government uh, has put forward. Uh, it's based on the very simple concept that when you have, um, as you pointed out, or, or one of the uh, other panelists pointed out, uh, you know, we have two large economies in the world and one of them is one that has shown through its behavior over the last several years that it cannot be trusted um, Xi Jinping recently said that uh, um, we must build a backbone of private business people that is dependable and, quote, usable in key moments. Adding to that, the uh, various uh, national security laws that, uh, that we've seen, uh, it's quite simple uh, from our perspective that uh, a lot of these Chinese companies that, uh, that we found fault with are untrusted operators. Uh, and what we've concluded based on our, our analysis is that uh, they should not form the backbone of basic infrastructure, especially 5G, given the, the whole range of, uh, of attack surfaces and uh, uh, present in that new technology. Uh, the, the clean network is really just an initiative that the United States is putting forward to, to ask countries that, uh, that have the same concerns that we do about uh, um, the security of their networks, uh, problems with having companies beholden to a regime uh, that, uh, as was mentioned uh, previously, um, where there's no judicial review, that's not something that we would want in our networks. It is not uh, a trade action. It's not a retaliation. It's not an attempt to gain leverage. It's quite simply the belief that, uh, that uh, the economic uh, um, consequences um, and the national security consequences uh, of including untrusted vendors in our networks or in the networks of friends and allies uh, that it's a cost that uh, the countries need uh, to keep in mind. I'll go ahead and stop there so that we have uh, time for uh, conversation. 
All right, so uh, Peishi, uh, if you want to uh, respond to that first, and then uh, we'll go to Feng Guo if he wants to respond also. Yeah, thank you, Milton. Uh, it's, so the, the moment might pass, so I have to say a few words about what Stephen has said about uh, his understanding about uh, the Chinese internet governance model. Uh, so it is about uh, this uh, very old debate about the mighty stakeholder uh, model and China has repeatedly, by the way, uh, expressed its uh, support about the mighty stakeholder model uh, from the low, uh, lower officials uh, to the president's uh, speeches, the mighty stakeholder has been written in the same way as multilateralism in the uh, official documents. Uh, though these voices are not very well heard. Uh, by the way, in terms of cyber sovereignty, we had a debate last year at the United Nations in the same in the digital sovereignty session. I actually argued uh, last year that uh, it is actually the United States, uh, that the United States is the biggest cyber sovereignist instead of China. And uh, though uh, the United States is also the biggest supporter of a mighty stakeholder, but that, that doesn't mean the United States is not the supporter of cyber sovereignty, is actually the biggest supporter of also cyber sovereignty. So the, uh, the kind of uh, the result will be decided by the cyber sovereignists and the mighty stakeholders in the United States is actually a domestic issue. China is uh, somehow a supporter of both, but uh, uh, I would say that the military extension into the cyberspace is the kind of uh, symbol of uh, cyber sovereignty. So that is a kind of uh, 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 feedback to what Stephen has said about uh, cyber sovereignty and mighty stakeholder. Okay, uh, Feng Guo, did you want to come in, uh, respond a bit to Stephen? Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to comment very br briefly, uh, but uh, before my intervention, I would like to uh, 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 say that uh, in this workshop, in this uh, uh, discussion, I'm not representing the Chinese government uh, because indeed I was, I, I am a representative of the, uh, the MIT in the uh, governmental advisory committee in the ICANN, but in other occasion, I uh, am not, uh, uh, representing the government. Uh, so I would like to comment uh, totally in my personal capacity. Uh, just uh, perhaps uh, in responding to the, uh, to the uh, intervention by uh, Stephen, uh, I would like to uh, uh, talk about two points. Uh, the first one is about the, uh, 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 it's about the, the uh, whether uh, there is a cyber sovereignty. I think uh, in the cyberspace, uh, 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 there does exist uh, the concept or the, uh, there is a cyber sovereignty because in the real world, we, uh, we have uh, the sovereignty because each state, each country claim uh, it has its own sovereignty. And in cyberspace, in the era of internet, uh, because the country or the state doesn't uh, uh, vanished, uh, still exists in the cyberspace. So I think uh, uh, it is a, a proper, uh, perhaps a proper claim uh, by the, by some state, by some country uh, to, to say that uh, it has uh, uh, a level of uh, uh, cyber sovereignty. Uh, and another point is that uh, uh, no matter a country or a government uh, uh, speak or not the the word the term of uh, cyber sovereignty uh, it does exist because uh, perhaps uh, from my personal view uh, the, there is a clear evidence that uh, uh, the clean network initiative is uh, a clear evidence of the cyber sovereignty and also the gdpr uh, from the uh, european europe uh, in, in, initiative on the GDPR, the law, European law, is another uh, evident uh, of the uh, evidence of the cyber sovereignty. Uh, so this is my ob observation. Thank you. Okay, so um, 
Charles, you want to jump in quick? Yeah, uh, uh, I, uh, I just want to add a, a word or two saying that, you know, I wish all these barriers would go away uh, as a user. I mean, I, I probably am an idealist and an old school uh, person as far as the internet goes. I first used the internet, believe it or not, 1982. I mean, we all believed at the time that it was a network of networks that we, uh, is not run by any government. Uh, but unfortunately, the cyberspace of today is not the same. But I do still, as a user, wish that all these censorship and surveillance would go away by anybody. And it hurt me as a user to see the powers, uh, both sides, you know, pointing fingers at, at each other and saying that you're better than I am. Uh, that's not that's not finding common similarities, right? Right. I, I think that's absolutely true. And I, I really, um, I'm going to get the last word here. Um, when Stephen says that he doesn't trust China and can't allow their equipment into the network, and China says they don't allow uh, Facebook and Google into their market. Uh, they're pretty much saying the same thing. And they're both, in my opinion, upholding some notion of, of, of territorialization or cyber sovereignty. And uh, like Charles, we, we are not so enthusiastic about these barriers. But now we need to move on. We have some very interesting commentators who are not from the US or China. We have uh, Eugenio Gagliardone, who is a professor in, in South Africa. And uh, we have Joanna Kuleza from Europe, uh, Poland, and uh, Jyoti Pandey from India. So each of those are now going to grapple with a question for about four minutes on what impact the US-China conflict has on the rest of the world. I was, in fact, somewhat uh, astounded at the degree of interest in the US election um, that uh, I saw happening. And uh, uh, now, I guess, the um, the issue is this conflict between the US and China does affect the rest of the world uh, as much as, if not more than the election outcome. So let's start with Eugenio. We'll then go to uh, Joanna and then to Jyoti. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Milton. And thank you everyone for joining this fascinating, a bit heated uh, conversation, but that's what makes it interesting. So um, I, since we have limited time, I thought of wrapping up my, uh, my remarks around three points. Uh, and just a small introduction, this is not half the cuff. Uh, this is, comes from like 10 years of research in different countries in Africa that uh, emerged in the book that was published last year. I don't have to promote it, but uh, it's a book that is, is the result of, uh, of that kind of engagement. So being on the ground rather than having these kind of rhetorical battles between standards and ideals, uh, it's just speaking with a lot of African leaders, uh, entrepreneurs, computer scientists and so forth. So what my first remark, there is often a fear that uh, China is going to promote uh, its own model of the internet, an authoritarian model of the internet that was mentioned. Uh, in my research, I've seen that that's very much not the case. And uh, China has developed very different uh, relations and approaches with different countries uh, from uh, authoritarian Ethiopia, where Ethiopia received the largest loan in the history of telecommunication in Africa, more than $3 billion. Uh, from two democratic Kenya, where China has played a very small role uh, in a very liberalized market. And actually to uh, point to one of the remarks made by our colleague from the State Department, uh, when uh, uh, authoritarian states uh, decided to promote legislations or policies or intervention that have constrained the internet, uh, it is often the securitization agenda that stems from the United States after the 9-11 uh, that was used to justify those kind of uh, uh, initiatives. And the fact that the Chinese model is not put on uh, users, government, and so forth, doesn't mean that China's presence is relevant. We refer back to the idea of multi steel calderism, and China is tended to help governments uh, in developing their own vision of the information society. So empowering one actors over others. And these has consequences for sure. So my second point, uh, and this is based on more recent research, uh, is that interestingly, uh, Chinese company, mostly Huawei and ZTE, have sort of uh, developed a different approach when they marketed their own products. Uh, and here I'm referring in particular to project like Say City and Smart City. So a combination of uh, IoT and different models of surveillance to 
um, help like traffic, uh, but also improve uh, control over crime and so forth. And it's interesting to see how these companies have actually marketed their uh, stemming from China as a reason from a country that has done very well with surveillance and maintaining public order to convince China, um, African governments to purchase their technologies uh, in, uh, uh, as compared to others. And these also in, introduce an interesting contradictions so when we say that uh, Huawei and CTE are agents of the Chinese states. Because actually when the Chinese state has, has refrained from uh, imposing or su even suggesting its own models, uh, actually com companies for commercial gains uh, have actually said, well, we are from China, we are good at it. Uh, so why don't we look at us as, as compared to our Japanese competitors or American competitors? And this is an interesting point to disentangle. And then the final point that I'm trying, that I, I want to make is that uh, um, like with Charles, you know, I was, you know, when my modem was cracking in my house, I, I was so empowered to feel part of the global internet where I could hide and be free and so forth. Uh, and this was taken politically and uh, to, to frame these as liberation technology or technology of freedom. And then we, we unfortunately saw how they did a very poor job in defeating dictators or they defeated for a while, then power was, uh, was brought back into the hands of uh, those who had it before. Egypt is one case. But then there is also a, 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 a kind of like uh, uh, expectation that where technology of freedom have failed, uh, technology of unfreedom will succeed, like because uh, of their more like uh, secretive uh, evil natures and so forth. In research that uh, stems from Pakistan, so not my area, but also from Uganda and from Kenya, we have seen that also uh, ZTE smart cities or Huawei safe cities uh, have failed quite miserably. So there is the fear that China is coming with its perfect technology that it's gonna produce this kind of sur surveillance states and authoritarian regimes. Uh, but we don't uh, uh, take into consideration the different technopolitical regime that exists in this country. So China is a very clean ecosystem that allows this technology to work in particular ways, both for social norms, technological infrastructure and so forth. But then when you take this technology to Mombasa, it's going to mess up as uh, the technology of freedom has done in the past. So we have to, I think what I'm suggesting here, we have to be more nuanced uh, and sort of like distance ourselves from like this big paradigm about freedom and unfreedom, because if we look at things on the ground, the, the, the picture that emerges is very different, more, more, much more nuanced and allows much more room for maneuvering and contestation by different actors. Very good. Uh, thank you, uh, Eugenio. That's some very important points. And so now let's move quickly to Joanna from Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Milton. Thank you for having me here. This is a fascinating discussion. Just four minutes. So I'm going to be very brief and I'm going to start with the conclusions just to try and join in the discussion. Thank you very much for those controversial statements that they kind of make my job much easier. If I was to say where and how Europe finds itself in that global discussion, I would use an old Polish proverb. We would be meeting in Poland if this was happening face to face. And there's a proverb that roughly translates to two actors fighting and the third one taking the cake. I think this is the position that Europe is currently trying to play. So when we look at this potential Cold War between two very different approaches, what Europe is trying to do is it is trying to offer a third way. Now, we've heard this said very clearly from Stephen that either US or the highway, the US way or the highway, anything else is non-democratic. Now, let me go back to the speech by President Macron at the IGF two years back in 2018, where he clearly emphasized that there is indeed a third way, one that is based on human rights, on co-regulation, on open market, that is more concerned with individual rights, including privacy, with consumer protection, more so than would be the case in the US, but at the same time prioritizes the multi-stakeholder model of governance. So I would view the impact that this discourse has on Europe in that context. Now, if I was to give you a very brief recap on what happened in the last two years since that speech, since the Paris call that incorporated these principles, 
I would say that what is happening currently in Europe is a very intense process of testing what this means in practice. I will uh, add links to uh, the chat, but the key term, if you want to research it, would be strategic autonomy. It's not cyber sovereignty. I'm fascinated with the notion. I love having discussions around sovereignty online, but I agree with Milton. It is tremendously challenging. What we are looking into in Europe right now would be strategic autonomy. What we want to do is we want to take the principles you have seen in the, NI and, uh, in the uh, um, NIS directive. We want to see how the GDPR and the NIS directive translate onto individual national decisions that deal, for example, with buying 5G equipment. I strongly support Ingenio in emphasizing that these models come from relatively highly uniform economies and politics. When it comes down to the international level, Europe is a wonderful testing ground because we are so diverse. And at the same time, the coherence of decision-making is highest than anywhere in the world. So I would argue that the takeaway from this battle, from this potential Cold War for Europe, would be a unique opportunity to push this discussion forward in a third way, one that is based on a human rights friendly approach, protecting individuals. We have an intense history that has led us to GDPR. I would argue that the GDPR would not so much be an example in transboundary lawmaking, but rather a spillover effect. Look at what's happening in the US and California, where it's the GDPR that had a very strong as yet voluntary effect. So I know it's just four minutes and I could go on into more details. I will add a few links to the chat uh, just to give you more reference, but I would view this specific discussion as an opportunity for Europe to move on at a very steady pace as we have done in the last two years forward and becoming the leader in finding the balance between those two contrasting approaches. We're going to stop here. I'm looking forward to questions and further discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joanna. That's a very um, um, stimulating perspective, and I wish we, we, I hope we do have time to follow up. Now let's turn to uh, Jyoti Pandey, and uh, Jyoti is a researcher at uh, the Internet Governance Project, and she has a, again a unique perspective on this uh, because of the relationship with. India, another large national market, and something that has some tensions with both the US and China, but seems to, uh, again, exist in some kind of state of its own. So I'll turn it over to you, Jyoti. Thanks, Milton. I think the state uh, that best describes India's stance at the moment is swinging because it certainly hasn't found its legs, whether to support US or whether to uh, support the Chinese model. Um, in terms of uh, what, what is the impact of the US-China conflict uh, on India's uh, stance on internet governance? I think there are two uh, really important developments uh, that this conflict has, uh, you know, um, added to. The first is that, uh, you know, there, that India, because of this US-China conflict, is moving away from the multi-stakeholder model. Um, we could see that in 2016, 2017, you know, it came forth in support of uh, adopting a more open uh, multi-stakeholder approach to participating in internet governance uh, processes. But as it has seen the US-China trade war pick up, uh, it's started focusing more on the securitization of uh, technology governance issues and using national security as a justification to uh, rein in foreign firms. Uh, what is interesting in the Indian context is that uh, while Huawei and ZTE are seen as uh, tools of uh, Chinese hegemony, uh, similarly, Google and Facebook are viewed as, uh, you know, um, tools of American hegemony. And India is, although it is probably not adopted that particular term, but in keeping with uh, what Joanna pointed out about Europe, I think a lot of India's um, you know, response to this conflict is about retaining its strategic autonomy. Um, the entire um, debate on internet governance and technology governance is also uh, 
really shaped by the fact that India and China share a border and the national security issues uh, therefore get, you know, uh, trumped up within the domestic politics a lot. And uh, we've seen that play out with the recent bans on uh, Chinese apps in India. But again, there's another aspect to it where Chinese investment uh, in Indian uh, tech startups is actually quite significant. And the Indian government hasn't really tackled um, that aspect yet. Uh, but we do see the Indian government moving towards uh, the recognition that we probably want to be very careful about who we, which country is being allowed to invest in our uh, growing ecosystem. Um, India is also adopting tactics from both US and China. So they haven't entirely given up the idea of an open internet and you know a globally connected uh, world, uh, but they're also um, really emboldened by the Chinese approach of creating national champions. And you can see this um, in efforts such as data localization or uh, making changes to their foreign direct investment policy where, uh, you know, they specifically, they specifically target uh, countries that they share a border with, um, which is probably aimed at China. Um, another issue that I think um, is worth pointing out that it is usually see in most debates, uh, tech nationalism is called out as grandstanding. But from the Indian perspective, there's growing consensus that, um, you know, it should also be viewed as an acknowledgement that this current status quo doesn't work for non-dominant uh, countries. So US is a leader and, you know, US companies, for the US companies, India is a huge market, but India views, wants to move beyond being just a huge market for either China or for the US and wants to, you know, participate and shape, uh, you know, how, and play a greater role in internet governance. And a lot of its moves reflect, you know, it's, uh, shifting tendency towards this. Um, again, like Joanna, I can add a lot more. On 5G specifically, um, there has been, following the recent border clashes, um, I believe the Indian government was not really clear about um, the participation of Chinese firms. Um, I was, it was in a confused state for a very long time, but following recent border clashes, I think there is some sort of consensus developing there where uh, you know we've had uh, state telecom operators uh, closing off contracts with um, Chinese companies. So it's likely that uh, India will uh, keep China away from its 5G ecosystem. Um, and then this is not limited to just, um, you know, we've seen India play, be wary of Chinese influence. It did not, it walked away from participating in the Belt and Road Initiative. It walked away from the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So I think the larger trade and security um, relationship with China is making India choose sides at the moment. But India's stance is more geared towards retaining space for itself to take decision for shaping its own markets rather than, you know, choosing the U.S. model of Internet governance versus the Chinese model of Internet governance. Happy to expand on any of these issues. OK, good. So um, I'm going to quickly scan the questions here. Um, I wonder if anybody wants to follow up on what was said by the others um, or answer any particular question before we move on. All right, in that case, we will move on to the next question. Um, and this is where we will allow comments from anybody willing. Um, this question is, what, does the conflict between the US and China actually threaten to create separate techno-economic infrastructures? And we've touched on this a little bit uh, at, at the beginning where we talked about um, a, a new IP. Now, I just want to say we, we have been following new IP very closely and we would again reiterate that we do not, it is not a new internet protocol. It is not a protocol yet. It is, uh, as it was described by one study, a a list of uh, desired features and what kind of requirements might be needed to, to, to attain them, but it's not a standard. Um, the, the concept of new IP or the label of new IP has kind of been backed away from by the people in Huawei who promoted it 
Um, and I think the more interesting question here is the chip war, the uh, export controls on integrated circuits, uh, which, for example, does not allow uh, Huawei smartphones to use the Android operating system because I cannot, uh, the uh, Google and others, uh, the entity list prevents them from doing any kind of a, an agreement with uh, the Chinese providers. So um, Huawei is forced to develop its own operating system. Uh, China is forced to develop its own uh, integrated circuit technology. And so we see what could be the beginnings of a serious split in the very technical underpinnings, which could eventually lead to a new IP or an alternative IP uh, that could uh, be incompatible with the one that we have now. So um, who wants to address this issue of technical fragmentation or technical evolution? Stephen. I'll go in there and jump, although the, the smart move on my part certainly would have been to wait just a little bit. But uh, uh, I'm going to go ahead and address your comments about uh, new IP. Um, first, I'm going to um, wholesale endorse your, uh, your characterization of new IP. You showed a sophistication in your uh, description of it, which uh, I would also call a criticism of it uh, as well. Um, the most uh, important concept about new IP is that it's an example of forum shopping. Um, you know, Huawei took it to the place where it should. Uh, the engineering task force, uh, it was not considered uh, a viable option there. And so they tried to bring it to another forum where they thought they uh, might have a, a, a better showing. Um, again, I don't think that what the United States, I uh, wouldn't characterize this uh, as, as a conflict between the United States and China. This is, as I said uh, before, it's about the United States trying to uh, defend the system that uh, that has worked so well um, at all layers of the stack, from the infrastructure layer up to the application layer, with the protocol layer in between. Uh, we want it to remain, as I said, open, interoperable, reliable, and secure. Uh, we do have some concerns uh, about the the use of um, you know Chinese vendors, untrusted vendors within the, within the stack, uh, and. The decision that we've made uh, is that uh, we want to exclude that because we don't believe that uh, it can be trusted. The, the entities list is, uh, is an extension uh, of that tool. Um, we uh, don't believe that uh, uh, untrusted vendors should be able to benefit from, uh, from our technology in order to continue to purvey um, their, their product. Um, and, um, you know, as uh, Eugenio uh, pointed out uh, in, in Africa, use that technology in order to create smart cities that are really unsafe cities and tools of uh, um, Chinese um, uh, propaganda and efforts to, um, you know, export their, uh, their technology and de facto create standards by, um, by creating facts on the ground. Um, I'm going to stop there um, and just sum it up by saying the United States is about defending the current system, uh, keeping it open, keeping it interoperable, um, but also um, perhaps a little bit more than we would have a couple of years ago, uh, weighing the uh, reliable and secure component. Thank you. Go ahead, Eugenio. Uh, just two, two points. Uh, one of when is response to Stevens, that, that's not what I was trying to say. I was saying that there is a lot of fear in uh, uh, think tank uh, reports about uh, the Chinese are coming with their authoritarian technologies uh, and these authoritarian technologies are gonna enslave people. Uh, these technology are just not working very well. They are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're sold for a lot of money. And then in places like Mombasa or Nairobi, they just don't work and crime doesn't go down, it goes up. Uh, and uh, as much as like other technologies before have not worked. So I'm not saying that uh, it's because of the authoritarianism, actually it's the opposite. There is a fear that they will work uh, so far, they get stuck in the mud. And, uh, and the second point is, you know, this policy to me is a bit short-sighted because uh, the cheap war, it, it affects Huawei. 
But in Africa, the largest producer of handset is transient, is techno that uh, surpassed Samsung in 2017. So now almost like 50% of the handset used by African uh, users are produced in China and by techno or transient, transient is the bigger old thing. Yeah? And Huawei represent like five, six, seven percent of the market, maybe in some countries it's more. So at the end of the day, it's again an ideological battle that uh, attacks the bigger and most visible players. Uh, but if the Chinese government uh, uh, wanted to reach out into transient to develop the same policies, it would be able to do so because they're not part of the ban. So again, uh, when we get into closing uh, uh, a tap, uh, you know, there are so many holes and things will happen anyways. When we leave everything open, it's just much more, yeah, much easier to just all look into it than trying to fix it together. So I think uh, some discussion in the chat and elsewhere um, is about the nature of these uh, barriers, are they trade barriers or are they something else? And, um, and I think this relates to something that Stephen said. So the chip war, I think it's very hard to make a case that that is a trade move. I, I think it is fundamentally an attempt to cripple Chinese manufacturers. I mean, it's basically saying we have an essential technology uh, sort of the US really dominates it in terms of the intellectual property and the manufacturing capabilities. And we are going to use that leverage to essentially disable Chinese manufacturers. And I view that as a, um, a, a move that does lead to fragmentation, a, a kind of sovereigntist fragmentation, which is based e either on some kind of national security or military competition, but there's nothing to do with trade. We are hurting ourselves. Uh, the US leads the world in chip technology. Uh, we are doing nothing but hurting our market share and our sales and our exports by this chip war. Uh, so the only goal must be to somehow cripple the Chinese manufacturers. But of course, the uh, long-term result of that is simply forcing them to be uh, to develop their own capabilities, which instead of buying them from us. I'm, I'm not sure I get it. Charles. Yeah, uh, uh, I want to uh, follow on on that point that you just raised, Milton. Uh, while, uh, to be honest, I'm not a chip person. I don't really know that industry as well as I would probably for telecom and software and so on. But uh, uh, we do see a lot of uh, 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 commentary here in Asia, in Hong Kong, in China, that uh, the, this uh, chip war is actually helping China uh, to help them uh, expedite their internal development of these standards or, or technologies that they are way behind uh, the, the, the US. Uh, but now uh, they uh, in areas in areas such as the basic technology to the supply chain, they are convinced that they cannot they can no longer rely on foreign, especially uh, probably US uh, suppliers. So uh, whether or not they can accomplish it uh, uh, in a short period of time or even uh, in a longer period of time, that I don't know. Uh, I don't think anybody knows. But uh, uh, there is, of course, one school of thought that would say that this is actually helping them. Uh, but then again, I have to say that what's the, what's the alternative? Uh, how do you uh, deal with these uh, suppliers that the US would consider to be unsafe and so on, and you continue to sell them chips? What are the alternatives from the American point of view? I, I, I don't know, uh, uh, but uh, there is a possibility of, a, uh, of a actually you know, helping your competitor in that sense, uh, it, it, uh, ultimately, but you know, yeah. I would say the alternative is that, that um, <laughs> you sell them the chips, you, you continue the, the interdependence of the Chinese and American economies. And um, I mean, but, 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 but you can sell them the chip, but they will continue to make the equipment and these equipment have other features such as surveillance and so on. So how do you balance that? Well, surveillance is a social phenomenon and a legal and political phenomenon, and uh, you're not going to stop surveillance by, by denying any vendor chips, right? You're, and, and the people who buy and make European equipment uh, will, will be creating surveillance capabilities as well. I don't, 
think I need to remind anyone that uh, the US is kind of the world champion when it comes to internet surveillance. Um, and um, the Europeans have, have some problems with that, which is leading to some barriers to data flow between the US and, and Europe, as well as uh, problems between the US and China. So the, the idea that if you know somebody somewhere is going to make a piece of equipment that enables surveillance uh, is true, but it's not something that's gonna stop with a economic sanction on American chips. Uh, I don't think that's how it works. Um, well, I don't see a lot of um, discussion here about the separate techno-economic infrastructure. So I'm gonna go on and now we're gonna to move to what I hope will be the constructive part of our conversation. And I'm gonna actually cycle through all of the panelists now. So how do we get the trust needed for China, the US and Europe to open their digital economies to each other? Do we have specific practical proposals, maybe some first steps, maybe some uh, more comprehensive uh, visions of how this could be accomplished? So let's start uh, in kind of a reverse order here. Let's start with uh, Jyoti and then go to Eugenio, Joanna, Peishi, Charles, Fung, and Stephen. Thanks, Milton. I think um, we definitely need global rules for data governance. Um, and I think in the absence of some sort of, a, you know, agreed upon standard between countries on how they're going to treat um, data, you know, these conflicts will continue to play out. Um, and uh, tellingly, there doesn't seem to be any sort of movement to create, you know, global rules for cross-border data flows. So I think in terms of practical uh, first steps, that's something countries should definitely focus on. Um, All right, global rules for data and, and where do these come from or who enforces them? Not to ask us uh, too easy a question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the, um, the Indian bureaucracy would probably argue for, you know, um, situating it under the UN um, or creating some sort of, you know, um, convention for uh, data, you know, but uh, again, we don't know if this is the most a multilateral order for data governance is the most appropriate uh, uh, way forward, but certainly the status quo where every country is uh, drafting its own rules and you know closing off markets because it's um, not trusting other countries to handle its citizens data properly um, can't continue either so okay so i saw somebody in the chat suggested a new data i can uh, we'll let to take that up uh, later um Eugenio, let's go on to you practical proposals solve our problems for us we're, we're, we're counting on you i think i'm being over optimistic and very impractical but uh, uh one suggestion it would be to, to, to root the debate more radically on users. So I've seen there is a lot of finger pointing and, uh, and we are like excited about it. Uh, but at the end of the day is if we root and we ask whether or not, no matter who is doing it, the users is more surveilled, is, is, uh, is liberties are more constrained uh, and we protect the users, uh, things will happen from the users uh, upwards rather than uh, in, in, in imposing uh, restriction or standards or, or one or another. For example, I'm going to be back to the case of Ethiopia. And uh, there was a lot of like anxiety because of China coming to Ethiopia and so forth. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's because of China that Ethiopia is doing this and that. But it's, it's such a complex um, landscape. And uh, because of the Snowden revelation, now we know that uh, it was the Americans that trained Ethiopia's uh, Ethiopian spy in uh, digital surveillance. It was Europeans that uh, sold technologies for surveillance to the Ethiopian government. Uh, and it was the Chinese that built infrastructure. So if you are an Ethiopian spy now, you have been trained by the Americans to use software that produced in Europe so, to harvest data on the Chinese network. And this is not taken into consideration very often because there is this war among the big powers that Europeans are not sticking up to their own standards and the, the Chinese are doing their thing. And so let's, let's, let's consider the user the starting point uh, and, and, and bring uh, uh, the development from that point onward. And I think every, not everything, it's hopefully something will fall in line. 
that uh, resonates with, a, with an idea that I propose is uh, if we're going to talk about sovereignty in cyberspace, then what we need is popular sovereignty in cyberspace, which would be user centric. Let's go on to Joanna. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, support the power to the people, Milton. I think that's the only way to do it. If I was to look for a standard for data, again, trying to, I'm wearing my European hat here, I would say that we have the GDPR, which seems to reflect the consensus we have around privacy and personal data. The spillover effect is evident, but then again, as an academic, I am aware that it's not the perfect solution and there are serious concerns and we've had them echoed in this um, discussion here as well. If I was to give examples coming from Europe, we do have around the um, NIS directive frameworks that are being built. There's the NISA who's providing guidelines on 5G. GDPR is another standard we're using is the way that data is being processed safe? So I believe that there are international law standards we could fall back on. That would be the dogmatic approach. But if I was to give a very pragmatic uh, reply, and I am a pragmatic person myself, I would say that we would indeed need more transparency and dialogue. And I applaud the discussion that's uh, going on here in the chat, or possibly the IGF picking up that job and trying to build global consensus around how we perceive data, whether it's personal or non-personal, and where do we draw the line, and what could be those standards for trust. The European experience is with co-regulation, so not so much bottom as, as or top down, but rather working together with different stakeholders, which goes in line with the model of multi-stakeholder governance. I would say it's more transparency and dialogue that will hopefully lead us to tangible, practical solutions. Thank you. Let's go on to Charles. You're, you're muted, Charles. You're muted. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, setting global rules uh, is a good idea, but it might be pretty difficult, especially in an environment when uh, governments are actually putting themselves farther and farther apart. Uh, it's difficult enough to get them to sit and sit on the same table. And uh, uh, especially with you know so much talk about cyber sovereignty and so on, it's like uh, that means that it's going to be balkanized. So I think uh, in the short term, we might be moving a different direction. Uh, I would want to offer uh actually i like the idea of, of user uh, people sovereignty very much and i would add that uh, uh perspective about using technology to solve these problems some of these uh, problems as well so these issues as well uh, okay it's a great idea for people uh users to up to 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 hold on to their own uh data and their own identity and their uh sovereignty and so on but how do you do it well, in fact, there might be emerging standards in different areas uh, using blockchain, cryptop cryptography, and so on to uh, do some of those things like self-sovereign identity and so on that people are starting to talk about. So I would probably look to also, in addition to what's been mentioned, also possibly using technology to uh, emerging technology to solve some of these problems, to really put the... Uh, control back at the hands of uh, the users themselves from data to their identity to and, and so on. Very good. Hey, she, a lot of we've been heard is very global. Uh, we're talking about user powers and, and uh, global rules. Uh, do you have anything specific to say about what China can do uh, to help um, to help solve this problem? Uh, thank you, Milton. Uh... In terms of global roles, I think uh, we indeed have very practical uh, specific roles already existing. Uh, for example, uh, Joanna mentioned the Paris call, which has uh, uh, how many points? Nine points. And also uh, the Global Commission on the Stability of uh, uh, Cyberspace has this uh, eight points ready. Uh, about uh, uh, cyber norms and also China has also proposed something very specific that my colleague has mentioned. Uh, it is this global initiative on data security and it is very specific by the way, it is not abstract. And uh, in addition to that, US has a new president uh, say I think uh, there might be a very good basis for to find some uh, coexisting or overlapping points in terms of uh, cyber norms. 
However, also it is a, I think it is a more important to think about the internet governance or global internet governance from a, a world view perspective. It's important to avoid or reject uh, this kind of good good guy versus bad guy narrative or the good versus the evil narrative. I think that is uh, not uh, very uh, constructive. Whatever the situation or the policy is, the Chinese students are visiting websites in the United States and uh, in Europe. And the American students don't visit the website in China and in Africa or in Vietnam. That is a kind of structural problem. It is not a kind of very much a policy. Uh, situation. So I would also uh, emphasize to summarize what you have said in the background document a little bit. Uh, I think it's important to have a kind of initiative to depoliticize uh, tech issues or internet governance issues to reduce the ideological kind of uh, supply in these uh, matters. So this is basically what I think, Milton. Uh, can you give me a specific example of how we would uh, take one of those steps, like reducing the ideological, um, just a very practical step? Like, <clears throat> what would what would Stephen do, or what would uh, uh, Guo do tomorrow uh, that would would help? Us? <laughs> For example, about the paradox about the chip dispute is uh, completely unnecessary, and uh, somehow. Uh, outdated way of dealing with these challenges. It's not good for the US, not good for China, and it's not good for the world somehow. So this is something that should be given up tomorrow, uh, specifically. That's very specific, very good. Uh, 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 Guo Feng, uh, your turn. Thank you very much. Uh, for this uh, uh, specific uh, question, uh, my response would be uh, just uh, some initial thoughts. My response would be that uh, first, uh, perhaps uh, conducting dialogue between uh, between each other or among uh, different stakeholders uh, and uh, try to understand uh, different position of uh, uh, each other and uh, be ready to compromise. Uh, and uh, perhaps then take a different position and then take action. Uh, perhaps this is a methodology to cooperate when we have different views um, uh, to uh, a specific uh, issue. Uh, so uh, uh, with uh, regard to the uh, uh, specific scenario uh, among China, US, Europe, uh, so my uh, suggestion would be to uh, hold dialogue for the three parties uh, to discuss uh, the digital economy related issues. Uh, perhaps we can, ha we can have a uh, uh, track, uh, dialogue track for governments and, uh, uh, and uh, also dialogue track for think tank and industry. Uh, perhaps the IGF uh, would serve as a good occasion. Thank you. That was interesting. So you, I, I missed a little bit of what you said about the, a track. Um, you're talking about tracks for, for doing what, for discussing or negotiating? Yeah, track for discussion. Perhaps uh, uh, we can have a discussion among or between governments. Uh, the, the discussion uh, that is uh, uh, for the government people and another track for think tank uh, and the third, third track for the uh, industry, the leaders of uh, industry. So this is my, this is my so, suggestion. Uh, just uh, just uh, so suppose that Stephen uh, in, in the next uh, segment uh, Totally agrees with Pei Xi that we should call off the chip war. Uh, what would China offer in return? Well, what kind of a, a concession or step could uh, could uh, China make that would uh, be an incentive for them to do that? So I would anticipate that China company would would buy a lot of chips uh, in the future. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Um, and nothing, nothing related to uh, opening the market for information. Uh, at this moment, I uh, I don't have uh, a specific comment uh, regarding this issue. But uh, uh, my hope is that I I I want to I want to see a more open uh, market uh, in the China in in China, uh, much more. A free, uh, free flow of information within China and uh, uh, from China within China and uh, outside China between within China and outside China. This is my personal hope. Good. Okay, Stephen. I'd like to begin by complimenting my uh, Chinese colleague. Uh, they taught us in young diplomat school never to answer hypotheticals. And so I see that uh, he got the exact same training. Um, to respond to, to your question, uh, so I grew up uh, a convinced transatlanticist, and uh, I believe that, uh, that when the United States and Europe uh, work together uh, to face global challenges, that's when we work at our best. The, uh, the first issue that I actually had to deal with, however, uh, um, as a transatlanticist, a uh, young diplomat, was, were the banana wars back in the 19, 1990s. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that was actually a very heated trade dispute between the United States uh, and Europe. And uh, from the expressions I see on the, the panelists' faces, yes, it was absolutely bananas that the United States and Europe would have such a serious conflict over, over what was really just a, a minor irritant. Uh, so what, uh, what I would uh, say is the, is the first step, what, uh, what the United States needs to do is, you know, we have irritants right now, and that's what I would call them with, uh, with Europe uh, on, uh, in the digital space. Some of those irritants are very expensive for American companies, uh, and, uh, and we're more than a little bit uh, uh, upset by them. But uh, what we need to do is uh, we need to work with Europe and other like-minded nations. It includes uh, countries like India, I think, uh, a lot of other countries in the Indo-Pacific region, and we have to come together in order to try to strike uh, the proper balance between data privacy, national security, and economic growth, and, and have that balance be struck within the context of the values that I described at the beginning of my presentation uh, uh, today. And then from that basis, I think that we can work, um, work outwards with, uh, with very concrete proposals completely consistent with the multi-stakeholder model, completely consistent with the idea of governance of the internet that leads to an open, interoperable, reliable, and secure internet. Thank you. All right, so um, I'm now going to go fishing for uh, voluntary commitments. Um, I think it's only fair that I start with making a voluntary commitment. So I'm voluntarily committing to continue to harass everybody on this panel about uh, addressing this problem. Um, and uh, I think that I will make a voluntary commitment uh, provided I get the approval from Peishi and uh, Wu Feng to, uh, to hold uh, educational sessions on, on multi-stakeholder governance uh, directed towards a Chinese audience. Um, I think I need to work on my Chinese language skills uh, to, to pull that off accurately, but I think we can, we can do some translation. Um, and um, uh, are there any other sorts of uh, commitments that any of us would like to uh, propose at this time uh, to <clears throat> make the United Nations uh, happy? Joanna. Yes, I, I would uh, like to emphasize the opportunity to advance that end user focused sovereignty discussion within ICANN on behalf of the end user community. I think that is definitely something we could pick up. So we could have a discussion on the interests of end users and how they could be even better protected on the global internet. And that's something that could be relatively easily done. Thank you. So you would uh, do this uh, discussion within the framework of ICANN meetings? At large community, I'm certain would uh, be happy to uh, reiterate if this would be helpful. We've held workshops and with your kind participations, those have proven um, exciting and at the same, same time informative in trying to identify what the end user interest is. So I'm certain that there is room for that geopolitical discussion within at large. We've hosted 
events before, and I'm certain that is something we can look into again. I'm curious if that is something that Andreas would be happy with, but if that is the case, I am willing to take on upon myself to have those organized. Would that help? I, it's, a, it's a voluntary commitment. I think it's good. I think um, uh, Eugenio had his hand up, but then he disappeared. Um, I don't know if he's still here, but um, if he is, I will turn over the microphone to him. He seems to have disappeared. Um, Milton. Yes. Uh, this is not meant to make the United Nations happy, but it is uh, somehow a kind of observation. Uh, I think the, the, in this uh, high-level panel um, on digital economy, uh, somehow led by the secretary in general, uh, and uh, there is this notion about digital interdependence uh, that might be a very helpful uh, kind of concept uh, to summarize a little bit. And uh, so instead of digital divisions, we are promoting, and the UN is promoting uh, digital interdependence. Um, uh, it is a difference from uh, coexistence. Uh, it is uh, somehow an interdependency. And uh, that might be good to build peace in the cyberspace. Back to you. All right. Well, I think our time is up. It is 1040. And um, I want to uh, really uh, appreciate uh, the presence of the um, the government people here who are putting themselves uh, on the line a bit more than the rest of us. Uh, so uh, particularly Stephen, since we have a new administration and presumably he has no idea what, <laughs> what the new policy is going to be, although I'm sure there'll be some continuity. And uh, Guo Feng, thank you very much. I know you made it clear that you don't speak for the Chinese government, but you, um, um, you know, uh, do represent a Chinese perspective within the Ministry of IT. And Charles Mock, uh, again, uh, the uh, status of Hong Kong is very, um, I think, risky and shaky right now. And I appreciate your being willing to come here and speak out and uh, not worry about getting arrested for it or anything like that. And um, um, I think we all have to, um, I think we have to focus more on concrete steps that could be taken. Obviously, this is a very deep uh, division uh, and it's affecting the rest of the world, but I was really um, impressed by the way it plays out uh, in Africa, uh, as described by Eugenio, in which he's going like, let's, let's look at what's happening on the ground. Let's look at how the technology actually gets implemented. And uh, in some ways, you know, it looks like some of these uh, Global South countries are actually benefiting from the competing uh, systems here. Uh, hopefully we can keep it at uh, peaceful competition and go forward with a, a, a unified internet in which we do have uh, lots of different states and lots of different users um, exerting their own autonomy, their own freedom over what they do online. With that, uh, would you like any last words, Peshi? No, no, Milton, thank you so much for putting us together. And uh, actually we have some old friends, but some of the new friends, and there are lots of uh, very good insights over there. I'm, uh, uh, I'm watching this chat. I'm trying to also uh, uh, find some insights from these uh, questions. Uh, thank you for the kind of a brilliant organization of this. Uh, workshop. All right. Good night or good day all. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.